You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, welcome to the Choose FI radio podcast. Today we are going to be talking with Mary-Kate Williams. We are going to be talking specifically about this idea of from passion to profit. And I think the reason this conversation is so valuable is that we have so many times tried to stress the fact that financial independence is not equal to retirement. It's not equal to that day that you quit your job. Instead, it is about aligning your time with activities and work that actually bring value to your life. And I think for many of us, we do ourselves a disservice by not actually taking the time to consider what it is that we're actually passionate about. So I think this conversation is going to be an incredible value add. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing great, Jonathan. Yeah, this should be fun. MK is a just truly wonderful person. We had the good fortune of meeting her and her husband, Jason, at Camp Mustache last year in 2017. And we've kept in touch. We've been just amazed at the progress and what what she has going on in her life. I mean, she's a published author. I know uh, Stephen actually gave out her books at the most recent Camp Five. So yeah, it's just really neat to see what she's up to and can't wait to bring her story to the Choose a Buy community. So with that, MK, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited about this. And in particular, this idea of pursuing a side hustle that at some point actually ends up funding your lifestyle. I think that's maybe not something that you have reached yet, but it's something that you're working toward. And what's cool about that is that writing for you is actually a passion. But before you ever started to pursue writing, my understanding is that you and your husband were pursuing financial independence. And I thought we could start with that. What got you even thinking about this concept of FI? So we met back in 2010. I was fresh out of college with about $20,000 of student loan debt. He was living in a house. When I first met him, I assumed he was renting a room in the house with other random roommates. And then I found out he owned the house and was renting it out. So that was kind of a nice surprise. So he was very diligent at paying off the mortgage. So when we met, we had laser focus on paying off that debt. We have looked back now and have said we probably should have been investing more, but we were both just very frugal people, very thrifty. I think the point in our relationship when I said, you know, we don't have to keep going out to dinner. I can just make you something. He was like, okay, I have to go buy a ring because that that was the (laughs) answer I wanted to not spend any more money going out when we could just spend time in. So we were both very just frugal by nature, which kind of helped with us bonding together, but just focused on paying off our debt. We did that very quickly. So I finished paying off my student loans and he paid off the mortgage in the same month. And that was in December of 2012. So it was a very quick process to just pay that down. And then it was kind of like a, what's next? What, what now? What are we, what are we doing? We stumbled upon an article called treat your debt. Like your hair is on fire by Mr. Money mustache. And I read it and I sent it to Jason and he was like, cool, we did that. And we were like, Oh, awesome. And then a few months continued to go by and we just kept talking about, well, we have all this extra money. So I guess maybe we'll start to go out to dinner once a month, try a new restaurant, or we'll plan really nice vacations. One of us threw out, well, maybe we could retire early. And the other one was like, we're not saving that much. And about three months before our wedding, Jason found Early Retirement Extreme. We went through the 21 days, the 21 steps where it kind of broke down all the different things that you could do to be extremely frugal, uh, to plan your life, to be able to retire early. And we looked at the numbers in our budget, our very tricked out budget that at that time was less tricked out than it is now, but we thought it was primo then. And we were like, oh, we could, we could do this early retirement thing. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do that. That sounds like a better goal than just going out to a new restaurant every month. So we focused on that and we just very quietly lurked in the background of all the big blogs. So after we went through Early Retirement Extreme, we went back to Mr. Money Mustache and said, oh, this guy, right. 
uh, read everything there and we're kind of behind the scenes in the community for a long time. We felt very connected, but we didn't have any actual connections. Uh, we were always on the forums, like trying to get a Tampa meetup together, but that never came to fruition. And we were just quietly going it alone until a lot of motion started to happen. So it was a lot of time just continuing to save, save, save. And then finally, we were able to make some of the big life changes that Jacob has on his 21 day plan. So I think day one is move. Day two is sell a car. Day three, you know, the first few steps are huge. And you think, well, I can't just move today. But we actually were able to knock off some of those things in succession in early 2015. And so that has just really accelerated us to getting to our goals. That's fascinating. MK. I have a million questions that you can probably imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. You're the first person that I've heard of that's really followed early retirement extreme that closely. I think most people read it and look at that as the far, far, far end of, wow, that's a little bit crazy. I get it, but I'm not sure I could do that. Did that thought ever cross through your mind or was it just you guys were both smitten and this is, hey, of course we're going to do this? You know, when we first read through the steps, we were like, of course, we're not moving today. That's OK. That's crazy. But we, we get the concept. We get what the idea that he's bringing across that you can change where you're living to be able to save more money. So one of the first things we adopted was rice and lentils, which very quickly just became rice and beans because we didn't like the lentils very much. But we just kept our eyes open. We had some ideas of what would make our lives better. So we live in Tampa, Florida. And at the time, I was working close to our house that Jason bought right before the recession. So he was very keen on not selling it until the value came back. So I was working close to where we lived, but he was working in St. Petersburg, which was about an hour drive each way. So we had in our minds that either if he could find a high paying job near where we lived, or if I could find a new job closer to where he worked, that we would move and we would try to get all these things going in a row. And I was very lucky to have the right motivation at the right time to do a job search that led me to my current company and very quickly had the first interview. And I said, you know, this went really well. I have a second one. Um, not to sound like I was a, a cocky person, but I was very confident that I would be able to nail the next interview. And I did. And I said, we need to look for a place to live because this is going to be a long commute for me too, from where we're currently living. And that day, Jason found a condo that was next door to the, what the new office would be, had the second interview, got the offer. And immediately we put the house that we were living in up for rent. We uh, rented out the condo that was next door. And within a month we had moved into the condo, sold my car and had rental income coming in on the house that was offsetting the cost of the condo rental where I was walking to work and Jason's commute had been cut in half. We were looking for the right opportunity and it just popped up and all the dominoes fell into place because we had been talking about this for so long. We didn't have this initial, is this too crazy? We shouldn't do this. We had been talking about it and looking for this and it just fell into our laps. So, Yeah, I think my impression when I read early retirement extreme was one of anchoring. I was like, well, that's crazy. I'm never going to do that, but I can do a version of that that will get me closer to this destination that I ultimately want to reach. And, and I'm okay with that. But I love that you guys were just like, as a team, and this is what's so remarkable, as a team, you're reading something that is by its own, I don't know, by its own self-chosen identity is early retirement extreme. And you're like, yeah, let's do that together. And for us, I mean, his commute was a big source of frustration. I'm sure everybody thinks the traffic in their area is the worst, but I swear it's the worst here in Tampa. And, you know, he would have about an hour commute out in the morning and the bridge that he would have to come over. So there's two main bridges and they would both start backing up at 3 p.m. And while he, yes, he's a very good worker and most of his work is done by 3 p.m., he can't just leave at 3 p.m. every day when his boss expects him to be there until 5. So he would leave and he would say, well, traffic's backed up. I guess I'll wait till 6 to leave and see if it dies down. So I was getting home and maybe like an hour or so would go by and he would get in and he would just have that frustration from the commute. And, you know, we're reading articles saying how bad the commute is for you from the stress in the sitting. And we said, we need to find a way to change this. So there was a motivating factor behind it other than just, hey, this guy, Jacob, sounds cool on early retirement extreme. But we had a good why to do it. It wasn't just, hey, let's do it because we like being extreme. We had a good reason behind it, too. Hey, I want to go back to the house hacking that Jason was evidently doing. I mean, was he fully paying his mortgage with the other renters in there? Was he living for free? Was this the true house hack? 
I think if it wasn't a true house hack, it was nearly covering all of the expenses. So when I met him, he had roommates. So he was surprised that he could find a girl to date who was so cool with him having roommates. And I was like, well, of course, you have to pay off your debt. So I think he always had the mortgage covered between the different roommates that came and went. I think maybe there was one month where there was one room that was open and maybe that month he just paid more. But I think for the most part, it was covered by all the tenants that we had. Yeah, that's cool. Did you eventually move into the house hack? I'm trying to figure out the timing here of he paid off the mortgage at in December of 2012, you said, roughly when you paid off your student loans. Like, Talk me through what you guys actually did for housing in that mm-hmm. intervening time. Yeah. So when I met him, I was living in an apartment and we knew pretty quickly that we had found our soulmates. <laughs> and so I made it very clear to him that I wasn't just going to move in when my lease ended just because that was convenient and that was going to be thrifty because knowing that we were both very thrifty people, I didn't want it to be a convenience thing. I saw it more as a like commitment relationship move for us. So I made it clear that he would have to ask me to move in and it would be a very serious commitment we were making. And he said, okay, do you want to move in? Cause I want to make that commitment. So obviously we were able to save on expenses by only having one housing to cover. So I wasn't paying rent anymore. Um, and he was very clear that he said, your student loans are your goal. So instead of asking you to contribute here where the mortgage is covered, put all that money you would have put to rent towards your debt. So that accelerated my student loan payoff without impacting his mortgage repayments because the same number of tenants were still living in the house. And I got to know them over the year before I moved in. So it wasn't like these were strangers. We got to know our these people that we lived with and their dog beans and They were very, very nice people to live with and paid rent. How long did you have that situation for where you were cohabiting the space with the roommates? I think they stayed until the end of 2013. They stayed even after the mortgage was paid off just because they were nice guys. They definitely were not on the same financial path as us. And so we knew we were helping them out by giving them a good place to live to at fairly below market rent. So when they were ready to move on. We were like, okay, cool. We just won't rent out that room again. So we just kind of let that be their their decision. But we were engaged. We were planning a wedding. I think they kind of got the hint that, yeah, it'd be nice if you left. <laughs> so, but we didn't say that to them directly. I think they just kind of on their own were like, okay, it's time to move on. If we're starting 2013, you paid off your student loans, the mortgage is gone. And then we met you guys essentially four years later. Mm-hmm. Talk us through that four-year path of hey, here's what we did with our savings. Here were our priorities. Because clearly you had goals. It's amazing. You talked about the Mr. Money Mustache article, treat your debt like your hair is on fire. Well, you don't have debt anymore, but (laughs) I assume you still have significant goals. Talk us through what you guys did financially in those four and I guess five years since, since then. I was significantly behind on saving to where Jason was. He had several more years of a career, so he was already maxing out his 401k and other accounts. So the first goal after debt was paid off was for me to start maxing out my 401k. I'm sure you guys are probably shaking your head like, you weren't maxing out your 401k before? But I wasn't. My primary goal was just getting out of debt. So I started to put in the maximum amount to the 401k. From that point forward, we set up a Roth IRA so I could contribute to that. So the first goals were to max out all those retirement accounts. And then once we did that, we started to save for travel. Both of us grew up in, I'd say, solidly middle class homes. Like if we had a trip when I was a kid, it was just down the shore because somebody in the family rented it. Or for my husband, it was just, again, similar thing going up to Georgia to the beach. We never did luxurious trips. And for us, we wanted to travel. So the money that wasn't going into our tax advantaged accounts and our mutual funds and brokerages, we were putting to travel. The big goal was save as much as you can, spend as little as you can, which we were already used to doing. We just didn't have any lifestyle inflation. We didn't change anything. And Those first six months of being out of debt when we didn't have the FI goal, there was a little bit of lifestyle creep because we just didn't know what to do with the extra money until we defined the goal of, oh, fire, that sounds awesome. Let's do that. So I think I got like one of those makeup subscriptions because I was like, I guess that's what girls do, right? You just pay 10 bucks a month for that. So we had a little bit of lifestyle creep, but we were able to cut that back really quickly because we weren't getting as much value from those little add-ons that we thought we would, that marketing had promised us. So we cut that off really quickly and then everything just went to saving, which doesn't sound as 
glamorous as it felt, but it was fun. It was a good time. And we would just look at our budget every month and see the numbers creeping up. And at this point, Jason's Excel really took a a new level of awesome. I think at that point it went from 10 tabs to 20, which was very exciting every month to look at the different projections he was showing with our savings and how our different backup funds were all now fully funded. So we had the house paid off. So we had, well, what about a second home fund? If we were to sell this and we wanted to get something bigger or we moved to a place that was more expensive, like let's just make sure we have enough saved to just pay in cash. And we just started to save everything that we could think of between maintenance for the home, second home, maintenance for the car, second car, travel, all the buckets were filling. Where did you keep the money for those buckets? There's definitely, we've had different guests come on, like Fritz from Retirement Manifesto. He keeps multiple years worth of expenses in Mm -hmm. essentially liquid cash. Whereas Mm -hmm. Big Earn from Early Retirement Now talks about having essentially zero dollars of an emergency fund because he has plenty of assets. He has credit cards to float this. So there's, there's an interesting kind of choice, I guess, ultimately on, on how we keep our emergency fund. I'm, I'm curious, like you talk about these buckets, but were they segregated in like online accounts? Did you have them in Vanguard and they were just separated in Jason's Excel sheets? Talk us through how you actually did that. After the tax advantage accounts, which we were limited on contributing to, the majority went into our brokerages uh, that we have online. And I also set up an online savings account to get a better interest rate at the time. It was a better interest rate than just keeping it in the regular bank, but we know that we have a higher proportion in cash than probably some other people in the community would feel comfortable with. If we went full jail Collins, we would have a big influx into our Vanguard account right now. <laughs> full jail um, Collins. I love it. That's a new yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. But we have decided a certain amount that we're comfortable with keeping in cash. So the majority of it is in brokerages and the retirement advantage accounts, but we do have some in cash. 70% stock. real estate, 15% bonds is the numbers I just got from my, my buddy over here. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. And just one thing I wanted to point out, you were saying we were going to be aghast that you weren't maxing out your 401ks, (laughs) right? But I always say to the audience, you do the best you can. You make the decisions that work for your family, for your life. And I did not max out my 401k for the vast majority of my career. I mean, I think only until maybe three or four years ago at the absolute most was the first time that I maxed out my employee deferral on my 401k. So please don't feel bad about that. And to everybody out there in the audience, you do what you can. And of course, we are talking over and over again on this podcast about controlling what you can control and clearly your tax liability through maxing out or putting as much as you can into tax deferred accounts will help. You try to aspire to that goal, but you do the best you can. So yeah, just wanted to take a minute to uh, to point out that we all do this, right? We mm-hmm. all just, we aren't perfect, right? And that's an important thing for everyone to know. We're not perfect. But we do try to set the goalpost, right? I mean, it's like, it's something to strive for. I know that when I was paying down my student loans, I certainly didn't max out my 401k. Earn, big earn from early retirement now, was aghast at the lost opportunity from avoiding those higher marginal tax brackets. And it makes sense, especially when you see what the stock market has done over that last intervening six years. But, you know, the freedom it gave me to not have the student loans be there allowed me to make a choice that ultimately I wouldn't trade for any dollar amount in my bank account. So certainly then that comes back to the personal side of this journey and knowing what your specific story is going to be, which is hard to know when you're at the beginning of it. Very easy to look back Mm -hmm. with hindsight and say, oh, well, I should have just done this. But um, yeah, yeah, I I totally, totally understand where you're coming from. So we met you in 2017. We kind of have established this four or five year timeline. And my understanding is you guys are radically approaching being five by basically any definition, not saying that you're retired, not saying that you're doing nothing sitting on the couch, but you have achieved a level of financial independence that allows you to make choices from a radically different place than the person that's trying to figure out how to keep their lights on. And I guess I'm curious, like, as you want to look back at what you, the choices you made over the last five to seven years, what actionable takeaways would you want to communicate to the audience that's listening to this? What could they, you know, just like you were reading early retirement extreme and you said, Ooh, we can do that. What would you want to convey to the audience? I guess the main thing I would want to convey is to not make any assumptions or don't let the assumptions of your immediate surroundings, your immediate community hold you back. 
living in Tampa, it's pretty much known. Nobody walks here. Nobody bikes here. Everybody drives and you have to drive. That's the common assumption here. And in a city where nobody walks, we found a way to drop down to one car so I could walk to work. And if we had just let that assumption hold us back and say, we're never going to find an opportunity for that. That's crazy. We never would have prepared ourselves for the big change that we made. And we wouldn't have been able to radically increase our savings by changing where we lived and selling a car if we had just let that assumption hold us back. For the most part, we thought people would think we were crazy people for doing that. But everybody that we talked to, I mean, even at my work, they said, oh, that's awesome. You get to walk to work. I wish I could do that. It's easy to think that everybody's going to think you're some kind of a frugal weirdo, but most people end up saying, that's cool. I wish I could do that. So go for it and be true to yourself and don't let those assumptions hold you back. Did anyone in your real life actually follow any of the things that you were doing that might have been these kind of frugal weirdo items? So the location where my company was, there were a few condos and a few people actually looked into moving nearby but there wasn't enough availability or they still said, well, we would need a bigger place. We couldn't do a one, one, we would need at least a two, two, even though it was just them by themselves. And we said, oh, well, the one, one is really spacious. And they're like, "Mm, no. So a few people considered it. Our minimalism muscles were being flexed and other people weren't ready to flex that, but they were very interested in the idea of, if I could only have one car or if I didn't have to drive to work. So some people definitely a little spark, had a little spark in their eye thinking about it. But I don't know of anybody who actually made the change because of us. You know, I wonder how many people are actually, they actually have three cars or four cars that are sitting in the driveway that really haven't considered the cost, even if they're paid off of just having those vehicles there. I I know it's interesting. Just the hidden cost of car ownership is, is really a fascinating conversation. Yeah, we calculated that we saved $6,000 a year by selling a car that was fully paid off. It was just the cost of maintenance, the depreciation, the time savings. I think we put a value on that. But we, yeah, we still calculated that it was $6,000 a year that we saved by not having a second car, even though it had been fully paid off. Yes, $6,000 a year. That is crazy. I mean, if you think about for most people, someone making a pretty nice $60,000 a year salary, that's 10% of their gross income. I mean, most people don't save 10% of their income period, right? And then they're wasting that entire amount on on a car that, like in your case, you're saying it's paid off, but it's still costing you this astronomical amount. So yeah, I'm I'm glad you focus on that for sure. And yeah, I just kind of want to go back just to your overall story. So this is, as I'm hearing it, like a seven year path to five, which is amazing. And obviously you did these remarkable things with, with the home ownership, with car ownership, I, I kind of want to just go back to the college for a second and just see, you said you had $20,000 in student loan debt. I'm curious, like, was there any interesting takeaways from like your college experience? We're always looking for that second generation fire. Mm-hmm. Anything you could pass along that would be useful for the audience? Uh, absolutely. So I was able to get a 50% tuition scholarship to a private school uh, in the city because I really wanted to be in the city. Um, That was the same cost of if I had gone to the state school. So I realized that I was mitigating the the cost there of, okay, well, the cheap option is just as expensive as this primo option that I have a scholarship for. So I was able to choose the school that I really wanted to go to and that I think definitely has helped me along the way. So I'm very grateful for that. And the other 50% I had to take out student loans and buy, I had to, I mean, I defaulted to, well, I don't have that money, so I guess I have to take out loans. So I was able to get one private scholarship that was paid directly to me, and I put that into a CD because I thought I was so financially savvy then to uh, accrue interest, and I ended up using living off of that scholarship and the interest my final two years of college. So that was very helpful, Um, and putting it away and not looking at it for two years was incredibly helpful as well. I, Looking back now, I should have spent another three hours writing three more essays to apply for more scholarships, but that's definitely hindsight. So for anybody who's listening, who is in high school, awesome that you're listening to this, spend maybe an hour or two not listening to podcasts and writing scholarship essays. Or if you are a parent who has a student who's about to go off to college, 
break it down to them that an hour's worth of their time could be worth minimum wage working, you know, a local job, or it could be worth a couple thousand dollars in a scholarship and see how motivated they are to write that essay. So that would have benefited me. And knowing I was taking out loans, my parents had their own journey with debt. My mom went to law school on student loans and she was still paying those at the time. And she came to me and said, we can't pay the difference. Like there's no way we can make that up and we don't have that saved. So your the loans are an option. And one thing that she explained to me um, is that a lot of people have this misconception with student loans is that they don't have any interest. The reality is that you don't have to pay the interest until you graduate. So they decided that every um, month or quarter that the interest payments came in, they paid off the interest. So when I graduated, I only graduated with the principal amount of debt. So I didn't have anything that was compounding or accruing during those four years. And I think that was a huge benefit that understanding, fully understanding compound interest now and how it works for you and against you in different ways. That was one of the best things that they could do for me in their financial situation was to not try and go broke taking out more loans themselves, but to show me that financial responsibility of these are your loans. This is in your name. You're responsible for this. This is the decision you're making, but we're going to make it so when you graduate, that's all you have to pay for. You don't have the interest. And that was huge. You have a fascinating journey. And I, and I want to come back to a few of those points, but what about Jason? So he was able to get a full ride to college and then he got a few additional scholarships on top of that. So he was effectively paid to go to college. And his parents made a deal with him that since he was going to local university, they said, well, if you live on campus, then, you know, those costs are on you and food and laundry and all the things that come with it, that's on you because, you know, you have the scholarship. Um, you don't have to worry about the school cost. So that could be on you or you could live at home and we'll take care of all your meals and your laundry and your books. So being the frugal person that he was, he opted to live at home, which was great. And he ended up working, I think at one point he was working three jobs and then he would go to the professor's for the class and he would see the book that was listed and he would say, oh, well, can I use the international version? It's less expensive on Amazon. He would then get the approval from the professor and then he would go and buy up a bunch of copies of it and resell it to his classmates at a lower cost than the US version, but he still made a profit. So he got paid to buy books. Jason is such an optimizer. <laughs> <laughs> and we were looking at it like a few years ago. We were listening, I think it was to one of the first Choose a Five podcasts. Somebody was talking about college hacking. And he was like, oh, like I wish I had done that. And then I was like, why don't you write out everything you did? And he was like, oh yeah, I, I did hack college. And I was like, good job. I love that you don't <laughs> realize like, you hacked college until you look back at it. <laughs> yeah, like for him, it was just second nature. Or yeah, he would just do all, the, he had all these little money-making things. So he was quite the entrepreneur and the hustler. Okay. Now coming back and looking at your two stories collectively, because th I think this is the part that's so valuable. So we talk about the pillars of FI and how to reach financial independence. I mean, I think what's so astonishing is that you guys have done this in approximately seven years or less. And when you look at what you actually have done, it, it just makes sense. And the secret wasn't that your parents paid for all of your college and had you had you covered or that you were born into a silver spoon, but that you were willing to take action. You were able to make, as Brad talks about, that difficult choice that made everything easier. You know, we could talk about what careers will allow you to get to that median income or beyond. That's fine. That's actually a lot easier of a conversation. It's also a little bit more boring and it's a lot harder to pin down. It's going to look different for everybody. But these are the things that everybody has access to. And if you just stack just a couple of them together, it, it's transformative. And I can't imagine a more dramatic picture of what this looks like when it all comes together than what you and your husband have actually pulled off. Looking at college just a little bit differently, looking at home ownership just a little bit differently, and looking at car ownership just a little bit differently. Those three things combined, you know, a stacked with just basically hitting a median income or beyond, but the two of you working together as a team, you crush the game in less than 10 years. You have to stand back and look at that and say, that is one, remarkable, and two, that's replicable. That, I mean, I am inspired by that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we don't take enough time to like stand back and appreciate what we've done because sometimes we have our eye on the prize too much. So it is good to step back and do that. Thanks. You are absolutely welcome. Brad, what do you think? Should we talk about self-publishing? Yeah, I think that's the logical place to go for sure. Well, Mary-Kate, you're going to have to help us with this transition. <laughs> but one of the reasons we knew we really wanted to bring you on the podcast was 
the fact that you, even before you reach financial independence, you didn't get to this magical number, quit your job and say, okay, what now? You actually have started to dabble and created a side hustle around something that you're passionate about. And I don't want to tell your story for you. How did this get started and what are you doing? So I guess to preface before I ever met Jason, before we ever set our frugal powers together to make this massive money snowball. I have always loved to read and write. I was an only child, so I spent a lot of my hours in my bedroom reading stories, getting lost in the world of Harry Potter and other books. And my mom was a big reader and she instilled in me a, like a lifetime love of reading and learning. I wanted to be a writer. And just from the circumstances of I think the school district I was in and not being as focused on grammar and the mechanics of writing in school, which seems ironic, but believe it or not, I somehow got through high school and got into college with a scholarship and I couldn't tell you where to put a comma. I just guessed half the time and half the time I was right. And I just kept getting passed through. But I knew I loved creative writing. I knew I loved reading and I had all these stories that I wanted to get out. I was very lucky at my college to take a course on writing killer fiction is what it was called. And I had the right teacher at the right time just encourage me. Uh, my assignment for the whole term was to write a short story, and I ended with 100 pages of my first novel. So I knew that I needed to keep doing that. It's what I enjoyed the most. Other people would go out on the weekends, or they would just binge watch something on Netflix, and I was just binge writing. I loved it. And when I met Jason, it was actually the day that I finished that first novel. So it seemed like very fortuitous to me, like the stars were aligning which could have just been me thinking Jason's so dreamy, but it was very awesome timing. And instead of being intimidated by that or thinking I was some kind of a weirdo who who spends their time at 21 writing a novel, he was uh, very interested in that and very supportive and encouraged me to keep writing. And I was so excited. I finished my first novel. I read all the things on how to go and get an agent and get a book deal. And I was so excited to put that big envelope in the mail. And I was ready for the first, yes, we want to publish you. You're going to be amazing. And surprise, surprise, that never came. Because the reality of trying to be traditionally published is a lot of rejection, a lot of it. But I was, you know, encouraged by that. I said, every big author has gotten a no. I'm going to get a thousand more no's and that's going to make me a more tough writer and I'm going to pay my dues and it's going to be great. And so I wrote my next novel and, you know, same thing there, a lot of rejection. Um, and I actually had an interaction with a local author who just looked at me and said, like, you're 22. Like, what do you have to say? And just dismissed me. And I was so hurt by that because at the very least, I assumed there'd be this great community, right? Of writers supporting writers and that wasn't there. And so as I got the idea for my third book, which is what has turned out to be my first published novel, you know, I was not very good at sticking to the schedule I wanted to for writing it. I wasn't as interested. And Jason said, what do you, do you want to do this or not? Is this something you want to do for you or do you need this external validation? And he really helped me put my goals in alignment. Um, and I said to myself, no, I don't need external validation. I like doing this. And so he said, why not self-publish? And at the time I had kind of bought into the idea that no, no you, you can't self-publish because of course, every agent that you look at who represents traditionally published authors says that they will not take self-published authors. Like it is very looked down upon and that's very much the line in traditional publishing is, no, you can never self-publish. Don't do that. But if you understand the business side of it, then you start to understand why they don't want you to do that. So he encouraged me to research it. And so I looked at every possible question and clause. Okay, well, if I go with this company and I do this method of publishing, what are my royalty rates? And if I go here, what are my royalty rates? And what does this limit me from doing? And if I go here, then I can't ever distribute here. So I did a lot of research to finally come to the decision that I made of, yep, I'm going to finish this book and I'm going to self-publish it. And this is going to be the amount I charge for it. And this is going to be my marketing plan for it. I suddenly found a whole new passion within a passion of, I loved writing and I loved the excitement of building these characters and building this world and putting that on paper. But I really liked the excitement of making it something real. Somebody could download it on Amazon and read it on their Kindle. And oh my gosh, that's so cool. So I did a lot of research to get to where I am now with my third published book, all self-published, Go Indies. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> I wanted to go very granular with this because I think 
This is really something that a large percentage of our audience is maybe at least at the periphery interested in. What would it be like to write a book? What is the market for that? What does it look like out there? And do I have to get an agent? Do I have to have a traditional publisher in order for this to work? And we can really benefit from everything that you've done wrong up to this point and also what you're doing right, what you've learned across the way. And I think that's kind of the part of this that I wanted to spend a little bit more time landing on is where's the 80 20 principle in the self publishing world? What works? What doesn't work? You know, where do ebooks fall in all of this? I'd love for you to take us through a tactical journey of exploring this concept. I'll definitely preface that answer by saying there are blogs, posts, and a very clear way where if you want to be a rich author, if you want to make a lot of money off of being an author, there's a clear like 10 step way to do that. And it will say, you know, pick this, do this. And then based on all the algorithms on Amazon, boom, you should make at least this much money. Or if you want to be a ranked number one bestseller on Amazon in a given category, there's a way to do that. I did not go that path. I was very focused on, I wanted to write literature and I wanted to be a prolific author and I didn't see the gamified way getting me there. So if your goal listening to this is, you know, I know somebody who is now a number one bestseller on this very niche category in Amazon and I want to be a number one bestseller in a very niche category. Great. There's a hundred ways that you can find to do that. Go do that. Do you. It wasn't going to work for me based on my passion and what I wanted to be the ultimate long-term end goal. Not to say that that's not right. That's just my goal. So there are a lot of ways to go about doing that. So the first decision I had to make was, do I want to be traditionally published? And there is still a lot of value that agents and publishing houses bring. They will put a marketing juggernaut behind whatever books they are putting out because they've invested a lot of time and effort into it. So they definitely provide that value. And I certainly don't have the resources to put that much marketing behind my side passion project. They do provide value there. So if you want to be the next JK Rowling, then yeah, you're going to need to have that kind of a marketing support on the back end to prop up your series to do that. If you have written a book and you think, I want to get this out there, I think it's great, then yes, as you mentioned, Jonathan, you need to understand who your market is. Is this science fiction? Is it contemporary fiction? Is it a mystery? Is it a detective mystery? Is it a mobster detective mystery? So you can kind of go down a rabbit hole pretty quickly, and you definitely want to be reading what's in your genre so you understand, hey, is this the next this kind of book? Are you just like this author who's big in the space? That's something you'd have to put into your marketing. So that way people who are already a fan of that author or that series know, hey, I liked this. I might like this as well. So I get that intuitively, but how do you actually get in front of those people? Sure, they might like this other author, but how do they actually see you? How do they find your Mm -hmm. book? So that is on two parts. So there's an organic part on Amazon where you list your tags you have to put the proper tags in there. You know, if you wrote a nonfiction financial book, don't put that it's fiction thriller because you think a lot of people who read those books might like yours. Like it should be very accurate because Amazon will show recommended books based on those tags. Secondly is your book blurb. That is what displays on Amazon. It displays on Goodreads. It displays anywhere that your book is talked about. Usually it's on the back of the book, but that's the description. That's what's going to catch people. The next place you focus on is Goodreads. So this is similar to like a Netflix of books in that you can put in all the books you've read, your ratings for them, and it'll recommend new books to you. So if you are an avid reader, get on Goodreads. If you're already on Goodreads, you know the rabbit hole of just sitting there. And after 10 minutes, you're like, I have 300 more books to read and I don't know what happened, but they all sound great and I don't have enough time to read them all. It's really great for independent authors to be on Goodreads because the avid readers are there and you can get your book in front of them organically or through paid advertising, which is fairly inexpensive. Um, You can obviously go and get the most expensive package for advertising on there, but I did a few text ads on there and it was 25 cents a click and that helped to expand my audience. And I targeted based on my first book was a sci-fi thriller. And so I targeted people who also liked Stephen King books and other sci-fi thrillers. More people added my book for that. More people bought the book through that. So MK, you described this kind of gamified way that people almost hack the system. And that sounded like it was a negative, but I'm curious if they have to be mutually exclusive with creating a great book and then also creating some type of marketing plan that sure might not be your ideal scenario, but if 
that gets you to the top of Amazon or gets you to the top of Goodreads, does it have to be looked down upon? Does it have to be mutually exclusive? Or can you, can you put those together and say, hey, I have something brilliant that I've created and I want to do both aspects of it, the marketing and the creation? Mm-hmm. They're not mutually exclusive. And I certainly, if it sounded like I was putting down the gamified way, that's not at all the case. That is the people who do it. It is hard work still. It is not easy because there's a lot that has to go into finding that niche category, owning that niche category and staying number one in that niche category. So I knew that my passion for writing was contemporary fiction. It is probably one of the most broad categories that are out there. So I knew at the outset that I didn't necessarily wanted to compromise what I wanted to write just so I could fit into the gamified process. So those are both great. And there are people who've done the gamified process and that has launched them into amazing careers of just they're making good money doing that. So I absolutely applaud people who do that because their passion was writing something very niche and they own it now. But I just knew it wasn't going to be what felt right to me because writing started as a passion. I didn't necessarily go into it because I wanted to make a lot of money. I did it because I loved doing it. And for so long, I thought that if I sullied my passion with money, then it wouldn't be as great. Um, And if I tried to write just based on, I want to make a lot of money, I never would have written the books that I ended up writing because I would have been very focused on owning a very niche category that isn't where my interests lie. So let's talk about the sweet spot. You know, you have to bring Mm -hmm. all this together some, at some point and you have to find a path that actually works for you. What is actually working? Has it been print books inside of Barnes and Nobles? Has it been self-published books that are, you know, digital and on Amazon? Like what are you actually doing now? And what is, where do you see this growing and going from here? And is it becoming profitable? I guess all of that is stuff that I'm curious about. (laughs) Yeah. um, So when I started out, I was still very idealistic and I only did digital copies of my first two books. A, because I could keep them inexpensive. And I guess with my own mindset, I was like, well, I wouldn't pay for a book that's that expensive. So I'll just make them inexpensive and they're only digital because that's good for the environment. And I had all these ideas of like, oh, I can just do that. And that's so easy. And everybody has a smartphone with a Kindle app, so everybody can get it. And I very quickly learned with the publication of my third book, which is available in print, digital and audio, people don't like trees. They don't, they don't like them. They want, they want a a physical book that they can hold. They want a paperback. So now all of my books have been re-released in paperback and that has helped my sales significantly. So with doing digital only for my first two books at a very inexpensive price, you know, even when I would sell 40 or so copies of one book, okay, well, it was such a small amount to start with that the royalty on that was pennies because having it that low in a digital format only, I could only get so much of a royalty. By switching to a paperback format, the royalty is much better and more people want it. So I'm selling more at a higher cost. So it's actually starting to cover some of the costs I incurred from marketing and design from the first books, which is great. So I've definitely found more formats, give the people what they want, paperback. They just, they want it. Don't, don't try and fight it. They want the paperback. (laughs) (laughs) Don't, (laughs) the trees are, (laughs) the trees are in bad shape, but you know, they, they want the paperback. Maybe they can print them. them. Maybe they can print them on bamboo. I hear it's uh, sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, I could probably charge twice the amount for that then. So, (laughs) so having more formats has been very helpful before I re-released all the books in paperback. And before my third book, the latest book came out, uh, a friend approached me about doing an audiobook version for my second book. And that did well. I didn't really have to do much. I just said, Hey, this is available on audiobook now. And suddenly people are buying it. And I was like, Oh, people like other options. Okay. Get off your high horse, MK. Just give the people what they want. So having that for the third book has been very helpful um, with the paperback and the digital formats. Now, what about reviews? Reviews are like the lifeblood of of a lot of different formats, not just books. I mean, podcasts, movies, everything else, everything, you know, it's, it's what do other people think about this? What have you found in terms of reviews and how they affect the traction that your books get? So reviews, absolutely. You said it perfectly, are the lifeblood of books through some of the organic networking I've tried to do. So there are a lot of websites out there that will post reviews. So you effectively give them a free copy of your book. They post reviews. 
for it on their website, as well as on Amazon and Goodreads. One thing I found though, which has kind of been a slippery slope, is some of these websites are run by people who just love to read and they're trying to fund their reading habit through this website. And they're like, great, I will take all the free books you will give me because I just want to read all the time and I don't want to go broke on buying books. Other people do it as a service. So there are becoming fewer websites that will do reviews for free that I've noticed. Usually they'll be like, oh, I'll do some for free, but I have this deluxe package. And then usually you'll send the book and then you'll get something back like, oh, I really think this should be on the deluxe package. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to spend money for a review. I gave you a free copy of my book. And I think that's just my own hardheadedness. Like I have not paid for a review to date. I refuse to do it. There's some really big sites that do it. And every time I see a book that has one of those re- reviews on it, I just think like, wow, cool $200 for that two sentence on the back of your book. Because I know, like I've looked through all of them and all of them started at a very high rate. So I have been very stubborn in not paying for reviews. And because of that, I also have not monetized anything to offer reviews for people for money either. I just, I don't like that. I think it should be honest and authentic. And With reviews, I found ways to do um, organic review circles that Goodreads will host. So say there are five authors, author one reads the book of author two, author two reads the book of author three, and it kind of goes through the circle. So there's no direct exchange, which is what you want. You don't want two authors saying like, hey, I'll give you a good review if you give me a good review. Like that's not honest and ethical. So they set up these review circles so everybody reads each other's book without any one-for-one favoritism going on there, which has been helpful in some ways. But then like a few times I'll get stuck reading a book where like, this is a great sweeping historical romance, but I don't like that kind of book, but it's well done. So that's been interesting where I have so many books I want to read. I've tried to not do those anymore because then I get committed to reading a lot of books that aren't necessarily on my want to read list which as I mentioned before on Goodreads can get very big very quickly. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was just thinking about the economics of this. So, I mean, when you've broken the game, you, you're you like a JK Rowling and you're making billions. It's been converted into a movie. It's pop culture. It's, you know, it's, it's on everybody's tongue. And then there's the point for the person starting out that doesn't even know they're still trying to work through, should they be typing this into Google docs or Microsoft word? They're just trying to figure out mm-hmm. where to even start. And then somewhere in the middle you, or even maybe closer to the beginning, you get to the point where you have a published book and then you've started to make profit from the book. And I'm curious for you, where you are now and where you see this going over the next several years, is this at this point worth your time or is it still a labor of love? And what would need to happen to, to, for it to move the needle and actually become something that could support your lifestyle? So it's, I would say now it's still more of a labor of love when I compare the revenue I generate from this versus my day job, which I still like. So thankfully, like they pay me well. I like what I do, but this is still what I want to do full time, whether that's in FI or before Jason hits his time to leave, maybe we'll just go FFLC and I'll do this full time. So this is still the passion. And one thing I've realized is with each successive release, I get a surge in sales. So I've noticed that part of the gamified method is to have a release all the time. It works because every time I have something new to promote or push, I get a bump. So that's definitely incentivized me to write more and to publish more. I still am trying to find the right amount of time because with each book that comes out, there's more marketing that needs to be done. And so I'm trying to balance my writing time, my time to promote and market the books, it's still a fun side thing. It's taking up more time, which is great. And I think that's going to push me more towards like an FFLC probably in the near future, but it's great. I love it. And I think anybody who's out there thinking about it, if they've just started, keep going, don't give up because as you publish the second book, it's not just, oh, this person who wrote one book. Oh, they wrote two books. Oh, oh, you wrote three books. Oh, and they're all available in multiple formats. You must be legit. I will buy it. And that's one thing I found with self-published authors is sometimes you can't tell if a book is self-published until you actually scroll through and find the information as to who the publisher is. And even then some authors create their own publishing company that they just own that has a so-and-so publishing that's not their name to mask it because most readers probably couldn't tell nowadays what book is self-published or traditionally published, especially when you can produce it in multiple formats through Amazon. And I think that's great. I think that is going to help those people who are starting out to, if their goal is to become the next JK Rowling, but you can do it. It's going to be a lot harder to start from zero. But I mean, she tells her story best that she started out from absolute zero and look where she is now. So it's possible for anybody. 
MK, I'm curious what this looks like. So let's say a handful of years from now, 10 years from now, you have 10 or 15 books. They're all available in these multiple formats on Amazon, et cetera. Do you still get sales from the original books? Like, are you still marketing them per se? Or is it just like a rising tide lifts all boats that, okay, Amazon, for whatever reason, in their algorithm by looking at your author page and your reviews and your sales, do they lift all of the books or did the older ones fade off into obscurity? I think it's a combination of both. And I'm sure their algorithm updates often. So whatever is true today may not be true 10 to 15 years from now, but I think it's a bit of both. I've noticed that as people have read my latest book, Enemies of Peace, I've started to see some residual sales of the earlier books and vice versa. People who read the earlier books were excited to see the next one that came out. So I could have a book that comes out 10 years from now. That's a big hit. And yes, the other books will benefit from that because I mean, if you think about maybe your own reading preferences, if you read a book and you're like, this is great, I love it. This James Patterson guy is really onto something. You're going to go back and read all of his other 50 books that are out because you had a good experience reading his work. So that definitely is true for published books, whether they're self-published or traditionally published. If you have one good book come out, that benefits all your previous work as well. And I have a follow-up on that as well. So knowing that you and Jason are both optimizers, and in Jason in particular, knowing that he is an Excel sheet mad scientist, based on the growth that you've seen book over book to this point, and without being able to predict any sort of viral breakthrough moment, how many books get you to the point where you are funding your lifestyle from this passion project? I think it would be another three. And that's mainly because two of those would be an extension as a series off of the first book. So having the series would continue to generate a lot of momentum. People love a good sci-fi series. So two of those would be part of that. And the other one would be a standalone. So I have mapped out those next three. And just based on the current rate of growth, I think that would get us there. I just need to sit down and write those three books. All right. Now I have a vested interest in this next part. Disclaimer right here. Let's talk about Enemies of Peace. Where is this available? Mm -hmm. So Enemies of Peace is available on Amazon and Audible. It's in ebook, paperback, and now audiobook format, which is part of Jonathan's vested interest. So yeah, I'll spoil that we- surprise. Let me, let me go ahead and announce <laughs> that. So my wife's passion, we discovered, we, we, we suspected that it might be reading audiobooks. And I mentioned it on the show. We reached out to Mary Kate to see whether or not Danny could actually read her latest novel, Enemies of Peace. And they collaborated and it has just been finished and just been released on Audible. There will be a link in the show notes to both the latest book enemies of peace and the audiobook. I'm so proud of my wife for putting this together and incredibly excited with how it actually came out. So I don't know if this will be a viral moment for you, but I certainly hope that people that are in our community that are interested in specifically fi fiction, and maybe you can tell them a little bit about the, the, what type of book enemies of peace is, will at least consider checking it out. Yeah, absolutely. Danny was the perfect voice for this. And even one of my reviewers said after reading the book that it had like a lemony snicket vibe. And I knew she was reading it and I knew she was bringing that perfect just voice to it. And I was like, yes, we nailed it. So I will say she is, there's nobody who could have narrated this book better. And especially knowing that she's also in the FI community. So one of the maxims of writing that I've always stuck with is write what you know. And one of the things that I know what it feels like is to feel like an outsider because of the frugal choices that my husband and I make. I know what it feels like to have those moments of weakness of like, I really just want to go and get a manicure and pedicure and buy that cute dress and have my husband take me to dinner. And I want all the material things that I see on TV and I need the reminder to focus. And I know what it's like to go through the home buying and home selling process. So what I wanted to do was create a book that our community could rally around. We have so many great pieces of nonfiction in our community, and you've featured most of those authors on the show already. Simple Path to Wealth, amazing piece of nonfiction. If you haven't read it, you're crazy. Go read it. Liz's book was amazing. There's so many books out there that are great, and they're nonfiction though, right? Well, I I love those books that I have read. I prefer to read fiction. So I wanted to write a fiction book for our community. And it juxtaposes these two couples who they couldn't be more different. And I don't want anybody listening to think that it's all just about fight. It has a, has a plot going on. The neighbors, are they terrorists? Are they not? I don't know. Somebody's house is going to blow up. Let's find out who's. Um, <laughs> but definitely check it out. It's a read that people in the community will read it one way and people outside of the community will read it another way. And that was intentional. 
it's very exciting to see the responses from people in the community and people outside of the community. So go read it. Send me all your questions. Steven actually came to camp with a list of questions he had for me. Like, why Why did you do this? Why, why did that character do that? I, I need to know. So send me your questions. I am happy to answer them and talk about this book all day long. I love it. I'm excited for it. And, and I'm excited to kind of promote this as well. So this is this. It was really cool to see this come together. And for those of you that are interested and want to check out, get a little bit more information about this book, we have set up a short link. You can go to the show notes and you can find all the information there, or you can just go to choosify.com slash MK. MK, I, I just have to ask one question because it, it moved on and I've been dying to ask this question. So we talk a lot about lifelong learning here and overcoming limiting beliefs. And I want to go way back to like when you said you came out of high school and like you didn't know how to write or didn't know grammar because it wasn't taught to you perfectly. But then in very short order, you were taking a writing killer fiction course and you were writing your first novel. How did you have the guts to do that? How did you educate yourself? How did you feel comfortable? Like talk us through the mindset of where you were and how you changed from basically the end of high school to the beginning of college where, wow, not only can I do this, but I'm going to. Yeah, it was a tough internal journey just to get the own nagging voice in my head to shut up. But it started with, in high school, I would just write poetry. I was emotional. You don't have to put perfect grammar and poems to, you know, reading more and realizing, you know, I occasionally will find a typo in a very well-read traditionally published book because humans write it and humans edit it. And inevitably there's going to be a missed comma or the word should be the, and it says to, and I would always just chuckle and laugh. And it would just make me feel like, oh, I, I feel connected to this other human who wrote this, not this perfect writing robot. And when I took that writing killer fiction course, the teacher was very clear of, you know, write what you want to write. People who publish have editors for a reason. I still will read books to this day where there are no quotation marks in any of the dialogue. And that just makes me feel that much more validated of like, I don't have to be perfect. And if I wrote a perfect book, it would be boring because everybody would write the same perfect book. So taking that writing killer fiction course definitely helped in college because it just encouraged me to do what I loved. I did in the, the past few years go back and do a course on Coursera where you can get free online courses. And I just took a remedial English grammar course and really went through the basics of these are the rules for when you use commas. And this is the rule for what a preposition is and what a proper noun is and all those things. And some of the things I was like, okay, I know that. And other things I was like, yeah, I probably should have known that. So having the humility just to say, I don't know this and I need to know it. And there's a free course out there and I can take it at any time. And I took it and I think my rating has improved because of it, because I'm more confident that somebody reading it who is a very strict grammarist wouldn't roll their eyes and toss it away. And my editor does a great job cleaning up the things that I still miss because she's amazing. But I'm sure inevitably there's probably still an, an errant comma somewhere in this book. It's been edited 12 times. And eventually I just had to say, you know what? It's it's good enough. I could sit on this for another decade and not publish it, just trying to find that last straight comma that may be out of place, or I could publish it and 99% of people will probably not notice. So that's what I went out with. And I'm sure there's some people listening who are like, but but grammar. And I totally agree. I want it to be perfect, but I have to realize, um, I think, is it Paula or JD who says, don't let perfect be the enemy of done. So I, I wanted it to be done and out for people to read and people to meet these characters. The real question is, how do you feel about the Oxford comma? Oh, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't want an answer to that. Yeah, yeah, not just, in our yeah. house with the Oxford comma. No, no, I really don't. I don't really don't want an answer. That. <laughs> but what I do want to know is how can people connect with you? Well, I am all over the social meds. So my handle on Twitter and Instagram is one, the number one MK Williams. And my Facebook authors page is also one MK Williams. So that should be easy for people to find. And then I have my own website, which is nailbitersnovel.com. Nailbiters is the title of my first book. Nailbiters novel made sense and it was available. So if that's the domain. And that provides links to where all the books live, any reviews that come out, any interviews that I do in the literary circles. Or you could just go straight to Amazon to find me because that's the easiest place to find all my books, which are available on Amazon. All right. Now, normally that would be the end of the episode, but on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I am so ready. In a world 
drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation. These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, MK, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. So I've given this a lot of thought because I now know a lot of bloggers in the FI community, and I didn't want to upset anybody by not picking theirs, but I have to go with Mr. Money Mustache. He gets a lot of shout outs on the show. Clearly, he needs it for all of his viewership, but his blog was definitely the one that Jason and I have stayed the most involved with. Anytime there's a new post, even now, years later, we read it right away. We read it together. So his writing content is so great. He really presents a lot of great concepts in a very witty way. So if you haven't gotten from everybody else who said Mr. Money Mustache from this podcast, go read Mr. Money Mustache. You know, I was actually, I was on a site very, very recently and I was looking at He has this one place where he lists where he has been featured or where an article that he's done a guest post has been featured. And I was just amazed at the scope of content that he's covered. Basically, since 2011, he has been just an absolute guiding light for this community. So, yeah, absolutely. He will probably continue to get shout outs on probably 60 to 70 percent of the hot seats that we do. And it's well deserved. (laughs) Absolutely. He's great. All right. How about a favorite article of all time? Question number two. So. What I would pick for this is actually a video, not an article, and I listen to it not infrequently, but it's called What Does Freedom Mean to You by Adam Baker at TEDx Asheville. And I think the official title on YouTube is Sell Your Crap, Pay Your Debt, Do What You Love. And Jason and I found this video as we were starting to jump into the fire rabbit hole, the way he just very concisely explains some of the basic tenets that are true to what the fire community is about and some of the the hypocrisies of our society. It was just very well done. You know, he talks about the industry of self-storage when, okay, like, do we need all this stuff? Stuff doesn't make you happy. It, it's really well done. Go listen to the video. It's great. Is that Adam Baker from the site Man Versus Debt? Is that the same Adam Baker? Do you know? Potentially. I actually haven't gone further down the rabbit hole just beyond watching that video multiple times. And that's the video I send to people when I have coworkers or friends who are not in the FI community who kind of complain about, oh, there's all this stuff. And I feel like I just can't get the paycheck to stretch. I'm like, oh, check out this guy. He talks about freedom and what it means to him. So I should probably go further down that rabbit hole, but I do not know (laughs) for sure. Nice. Well, we will certainly uh, link to that in the show notes. And yeah, I'm going to check that video out for sure. So, all right, MK, question number three, your favorite life hack? It's got to be the library. I love it. I haven't paid for a book in years because I go to the library. uh, We get DVDs there. We get CDs there. We've gotten museum tickets there. I love the library. I cannot sing the praises of the library enough. They've actually also been a very critical part of my success with my books because libraries pay a licensing fee to have books available. So if you don't want to buy my book, but you want your library to go for it, I would thank you greatly. That's amazing. I had no idea. (laughs) Yeah. They pay a slightly higher fee, especially for the digital books, because they can lend that out at a faster rate. So I make a better royalty off of those. (laughs) All right. Awesome. Uh, Question number four, your biggest financial mistake? I'd have to say the student loans, you know, having the debt and paying it off was a good life lesson. So I wouldn't want to discount that. But if I had been better, better versed or had better knowledge when I was younger of the different options to pay for school, I probably would have worked harder on getting more scholarships and not taking out the debt. I feel like you were 20K away from being able to say I made no financial mistakes. Right. I know. So close. (laughs) The select few. (laughs) Yeah. All right, MK, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. So I think about this every week when I hear it because it freaks me out because of like time travel. Like if I could go back in time and tell myself something like what would be the butterfly effect? It kind of makes me paranoid. But I think the advice I'd give to my younger self is just to believe in myself and to not let the assumptions that I think everybody else has about me dictate my life because that was what held me back from self-publishing sooner. So that would be the advice I would give to myself without changing my timeline. Wow. MK, that's really pretty cool. The butterfly effect. I like that. I saw, I think it was the movie, what was it? Sideways, maybe 15 years ago at this point. And, and yeah, it's interesting to think about 
these little decisions that you make in your life and where your life would have ended up at these inflection points. So yeah, I mean, obviously that, that's a, a topic for maybe a, another podcast someday, but yeah. it is fascinating to think of your life in that manner. So yeah, very cool. I wonder about that too. Like if I hadn't taken up $168,000 in student loan debt and gone down that 12 year hamster wheel of pursuing pharmacy, paying off the debt, then deciding, eh, not so much, not for me. Would I have started a podcast? Would that have, would that have been my story? I don't know. So it's, uh, I think it's interesting as an intellectual process, but not necessarily something that I would ever actually want to go back and do and change that path really in any way, shape or form. So great point. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a fiction author. So I think about time travel and things like that where other people just think, what's a good advice? I think, oh no, don't change time. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our universe can't, can't sustain that. Yeah. Like if everybody went back and gave, gave themselves advice, like what would happen? <laughs> All right. Now we do have a bonus question for you. Now, this is one that we have made a very intentional decision to pivot just a little bit now and talk about value. What was the purchase that you made over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? I'd have to say my new Asics. I am an avid runner and my old sneakers were running out. It was starting to hurt my ankles and my knees and I got my new shoes and they look great and they feel great. So I get immense value from them every day, at least four or five miles worth. So they were the best purchase. MK, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with the audience. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the episode today. I hope you got value from the show and I hope you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point. If you want to support us and what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P as in Paul, C as in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of FI, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of FI. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.